uh, we are celebrating the life of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, and I know he will be greatly missed by the world, especially the Commonwealth fraternity. So rest in peace, the Duke of Edinburgh. So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Badru and I'm the host today of this Be Life event. Um, I am one of the HIV prevention and testing coordinators at Positive East, and uh, also a uh, lead on community engagement. Positive East is an HIV and sexual health charity serving the whole of East and Northeast London. So stretching all the way from Tower Hamlets, Newham, Hackney, Waltham Forest, Buckingham and Dagenham, Redbridge and Havering. So to know more about Positive East, uh, you can visit our website, www.positiveeast.org.uk. So this Be Life event, um, it's one of the events, we have one every third Saturday of the month, but this special one um, is, go, is a health promotion event uh, targeting black communities, which is uh, African and African Caribbean communities. We discuss sexual health issues affecting these communities. This time we would like to explore uh, sexual health and relationships. Why? Because according to the Positive East Services, you know, uptake data, it is a very low uptake of HIV testing and sexual health screening services from people in relationships. They generally perceive that they are not vulnerable um, to sexual, sexually transmitted conditions, including HIV. And this belief may be attributed to culture, faith, um, maybe social status in the community. This leads to late diagnosis of the condition, whereas early diagnosis, people can be treated and they carry on with their you know, daily lives as normal as possible. But um, if they are diagnosed late, then there is a problem of uh, high morbidity, being very ill, and also sometimes leading to death. So people from this community always uh, are diagnosed late. And sometimes there is also hesitancy um, to come forward for testing or to be checked. In some communities, uh, low perception of STI risk is due to poor knowledge as well uh, of sexual health. And sometimes uh, people are not empowered enough to talk about their sexual life. On this, on this occasion, we have um, a very nice panel where we have a uh, cultural leader, uh, Mr. Dr. Charles Chaze, He's an African uh, born in Africa and uh, living in Canada. <laughs> no, sorry. He's an Af a Canadian born in Africa, living in the UK. So I think you have a wealth of uh, cultures, you know, throughout <laughs> all these regions. Um, <laughs> we have um, Father Gerard Barinya, a very respected priest from the Catholic Church. We have uh, Madame Storm, a renowned motivational speaker and an advocate for women empowerment. That is very, very important. And we have Sheikh Suleiman Kibuka, a, a Muslim scho scholar and Imam from London Central Mosque, Baker Street. So I'm sure today we have a wealth of knowledge to discuss this particular issue. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a set of questions from the audience. We are being viewed by uh, so many people from uh, Facebook Live. And uh, later on, it will be also um, uh, put on YouTube for people who are not able to see us live. So let's start with uh, Dr. Charles. 
Hello. Hello, Chair. Um, I'm quite pleased to be part of this panel. Um, yes. As um, Mr. Badru Malay has introduced me, my name is Charles Chaze, an Africologist. I was born in Uganda, but grew up in Canada. And I'm also a broadcaster. I work on different radios in the past 20 years. And uh, one of the major programs I presented some time back was Health Africa. And Health Africa was discussing issues affecting us. And at the time, HIV was very rampant. And what I learned from that is that we as Africans, we are very timid with anything concerning sex and sexuality, not only from a health perspective, but also from a relationship perspective. People very afraid to talk about sex. So to me, it is very exciting that we are here to discuss sex and the relationships. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Um, let's hear from Madame Storm. Hello, Madame Storm. Hello, hello. Thank you for the lovely introduction. My name is Madame Storm. I'm an international dominatrix, a speaker, and a founder of the Strut Masterclass that helps women strut into their power. I also work with a lot of women to help them to reclaim their sexual power back, whether that's been from domestic abuse or from sexual abuse through my online sexual and body confidence course. So I'm really honored to be here to join into the conversation about educating individuals about becoming sexually confident and having this conversation with their partners, because I feel that sex can be a beautiful thing and from my experience, I have worked with many women from many different cultures and backgrounds who feel a lot of shame towards sex and their sexual desires. And what that does, it, it drives them underground. And I think this is what the issue is. We need to have more conversations like this. We need to be more open-minded and we need to be more respectful for other people's desires. Well, that's powerful. Thank you so much. Um, let's hear from Father Gerard Balinya. Yes, welcome Father. viewers. I'm Father Gerard Balinya, born in Uganda. I've been working in the UK for the last 20 years or so. And uh, I work with the Ugandan community here in the UK and Ireland. Well, I'm going to discuss this topic, sexual health and relationships. On the pers from perspective of the church. The church looks at the family as the basic uh, unit of society. And of course, family comes from sex. And therefore, it is important that we focus on this point, on this topic, so that we open people's minds and broaden their views about this issue. Because culturally, especially in my a tribe, sex is something for the bedroom, something to be discussed quietly behind the scenes. You can't bring it in the public. But now, in the situation we are in, we have to come out and be more open and address these issues which concern us. Thank you. Um, lastly, we have Sheikh Suleiman. Sheikh Suleiman, are you muted? Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks very much, uh, Brother Badru Malay, and uh, salam alaikum to everybody. Uh, my name is Suleiman Kibuka, Sheikh Suleiman Kibuka, and um, um, I was born in Africa in Uganda as well, um, but I've had a chance of living in uh, uh, quite a few parts of the world, the Middle East, here in Africa and elsewhere. And um, it's a, I think this topic is very relevant and it's very, very important. It's been with us from the word go, it's with us and it's going to be there. And uh, I think we, it's high time that we discuss about it and uh, see what the different perspective dimension, the spiritual dimensions 
have to offer on such a very important issue. And uh, probably, I don't know whether it's a platform for us to examine the extent which uh, religious institutions can exert an influence and formulating policies, although we happen to be on a daily basis um, in constant, um, you know, uh, constant points of reference before, during, and post, you know, relationship when, uh, of course, the people realize that it's not just a question of sex, but also the implication and how all these are intertwined together. And we feel as members of the Muslim community and leadership, the world. I think it's a great opportunity for us to be given a platform to this. Thank you, Sheikh Suleiman. Um, I have here the first question, uh, and this is directly to Dr. Charles Chaze. Um, in most African communities, there is a contradiction in attitude towards sex and sexuality. Yes. Whilst African music, dance, and other forms of you know, drama and things radiates eroticism and sexuality. Many people shy away from the topic. How can we teach or discuss about sex, not solely as a means of reproduction? Um, it, it is quite an interesting question in that on the surface, it seems that Africans and uh, sexuality are very compatible. But what we have to realize that Africans look at issues which are cultural, not from their personal, uh, um, personal um, interest, but from a common good. And by saying that, I'm saying that when it comes to sex and the relationships, there has to be a common good. And uh, many African cultures, if not most, um, they look at sex as a social function, other than something from the West where it is a personal or two people uh, engaging in it. But from an African perspective, sex does have a sexual, um, a, 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 a social function. What do I mean by social function? Um, there are quite a number of things which it, sex does as a function. From one, one, the first perspective, sex is a way of um, what they call procreation. Sex has is done to give birth to children. And um, on the other hand, uh, sex is also um, it, it, for pleasure as well. And also, um, sex is also a family property. And I will come to analyze all of those, as well as the last one is that um, is also a function to dominate. And if we look at all these, when it comes to health promotion, sometimes people who are working to promote safe sex and all that, they don't look at these functions. When a person comes from Africa and comes to the UK, he has to understand that these perspectives are still part of his life. For example, sex as a way of procreation. Instead of people understanding the limits of sex when it comes to health issues, people look at prevention as a way of refusing them to give birth. Where procreation is a very important aspect even now when we are talking about COVID and all that, people are saying the vaccine is going to refuse us to give birth. So please don't take it. And this is a very important aspect to Africans and many people from the Caribbean. And so when you talk about procreation, that you have to wear a condom, then it becomes a major factor. And we have to look at ways 
where we have to explain our communities that safe sex does not refuse you to have children, but it empowers you to be able to have children who are safe, who are healthy, and also to protect your partner. The other one is sex is for pleasure. When it comes to many African cultures, you find a number of cultures where they have events where protect, um, self sex is not practiced because those events are to enjoy themselves. And in order to enjoy yourself, you have to be free from all detractors of telling you that you have to do this, you have to do that, but people need to come and enjoy themselves on weddings, on so many other different cultures, events, like for us in, in, in where I come from, we have events of twins. On that day where they celebrate twins, they, they indulge in sex, which is not safe. But people forget that it is those events that bring and emphasize the importance of safe sex. Thank you, and, Dr. Yes. Um, um, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it again as we go along. Definitely, yeah. we'll, talk, we'll look at uh, coming forward to have a test and also regular tests and things like that. Exactly. But there's a general question here. Um, young black people aged between 15 and 25 experience the highest rate of STIs. This is a, these figures are got from the Public Health of England. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of these are, you know, uh, young black African people. Yes. How can uh, community leaders promote sexual health so that uh, young people can make healthy and informed choices regarding sexual health and relationships? This, anybody can answer that. Can I personally, I personally feel that yes. you need to educate them to love their bodies, to respect their bodies, and to understand the consequences of having unprotected sex. And I think it needs to come from a non-judgmental place. And I don't think the emphasis should be about reproducting you know because people have sex especially young people they want to feel sexually liberated they want to explore themselves these are all very natural urges that, that you have and you continue to have into into um into later years and i feel that we need to speak more openly about sex and be more inclusive of people having sex but I really do feel that once you educate these young people and you mm. educate the women and you educate the men to respect their, themselves and to respect women and for them to understand boundaries, for the woman to understand that her body is a temple, for her to understand how much power that she possessed when she is in control of her body and that she has a level of self-respect and a level of self-love for herself. Because we also have to look at the reasons why, I mean, I work with women, right? So I'm always gonna talk from a woman's point of view. Um, why, are, why are these young ladies being involved in these sexual acts? When I coach a lot of these young people that have several partners, some of them are trying to gain that love and attention that they're missing from themselves. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done when we talk about the education and it has to start with self. I believe that once an individual loves and respects themselves, the thought of having unprotected sex and harming their body will have a much more um, relevance to them. Oh, thank you so much. So the, the, the words here are respect, non-judgmental, and also um, to make sure that people learn about their bodies. Thank you so much. Um, yes, um, Father Gerard, in the world of reality, we are talking about reality now, right. there is sex before marriage, including dating, during courtship, and you know sometimes cohabiting. It is during this time mainly that 
sexual health is of a very much concern. Would you advise some couples to protect each other? We've talked about protect and also respect each other by using prevention methods that may include condom use. Now, first of all, when you prepare couples for marriage, we have four aspects or four phases of preparation. We have the personal preparation, right. social preparation, spiritual preparation, and church preparation. So in discussing this issue of sexual health and relationships, we are looking at personal preparation. Before you go into a sexual or married relationship, you must know this is a serious matter. Some people prepare for the wedding without preparing for marriage and then things clash. So that's why we have to begin from myself. Am I healthy enough? Am I ready for marriage with so and so? And we are required, at least we encourage in our culture to investigate, to look at the background, the kind of background checks about the family of the person you are going to engage with, especially regarding mental health. How is that family? How is their mental health? Because some of these issues are genetic. Mm -hmm. So people have to be prepared, looking at mental health and sexual health. Now, coming to the issue you are talking about, to advise people about uh, um, issues of pre prevention methods, yes. including condoms. The church is very clear about premarital sexual relations. Because the church is saying, this is about love. Mm -hmm. Love is a self, free self-giving of the heart. And sexuality must not be separated from love. So they are intertwined. So the sexual encounter requires the framework of a true dependable love. And so sexuality and love must be intertwined. That's why the sexual union is the most beautiful bodily and sensual expression of love. So those people who look for sex without love are therefore lying because the closeness of, the, of their bodies should correspond with the closeness of their hearts. So that's why before you engage with a person, you are giving your whole self, my body, my mind, my everything to you. So there must be commitment, enduring love in marriage. That's why the church is insisting, look here, to not engage in premarital sex. Sorry, so that, can I sorry, mm. can I just interject? Sorry, mm -hmm. can I just can I just interject really quickly? Yeah. I think this is what the issue is. Yes. Today we're discussing about how we can help people to become more sexually confident. Yes. You've highlighted that people between 15 to 25 have the highest rate of SDI. True. And what we need to do right now is have a conversation not on what how they should be living in terms of their religion and culture, but we have to look at the facts. And the facts are people are having sex before True. marriage. Exactly. And, if can, and if we continue to True. keep dictating to people that, you know, well, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not fixing the problem. The problem is that yeah. they're not speaking, they're not coming to their pastor, they're not, they're not going to, to their mother or their sister because there's that shame. Because they, in their culture or in their religion, they're not supposed to be having sex before they're married. And all I've heard so far is how they should be living. That's exactly. all great. Mm -hmm. But we need to tackle the issue on how they are living 
at the moment, which is they're having unprotected sex and our sure. young people are getting affected. Right. We need them to come forward. We need them to go to the clinic. We need them to be educated on this is what you need to do if you have unprotected sex. Otherwise, like you rightfully said, it goes undetected. It then can affect their fertility. They then go into a relationship with someone. Then they spread what um, infection they have onto the other person. I think we need to have a conversation and it needs to go something like this. Before That's getting right. into a relationship, we urge you to go to a clinic. I think going to the clinic together is, is, is a great thing to do. Um, I find that especially as a woman, the onus of getting checked up is always left with the woman. I think that we need to encourage new couples to come together and go to the clinic together. If not, they wanna go individually, that's fine. But have a checkup before you go into this committed relationship. We also have to address individuals that are not in a committed relationship and who have no interest in being a, in a committed relationship. How do we educate those individuals on keeping safe? I agree with you. We have to tackle this problem from two ends. Okay? The issue is there. How do we tackle it? Okay. Now, for those who haven't had that problem yet, yet how do we tackle it from the educational point of view? So there are two ways of handling it, okay? So for those who haven't had exposure to premarital sex, this is the teaching. People should know. Those who have gone into it already, we have to educate them and look here, tell them, look here. Condoms, yes, they provide some protection, but not full protection, okay? And so the way, that's why the church rejects a one-sided mechanical method of fighting this uh, AIDS and sexual transmitted diseases. That's why the church advocates a new culture of human relationships so that people can change their consciousness and then so that they learn how to protect themselves. And that once that happens, then that's where what you're talking about can happen. So that's why we are looking at it from both sides. Okay, thank you, Father. Yes. Yes. Um, let's see what the Sheikh says. Um, Sheikh Suleiman, are you with us? Yes, uh, yes, it's very, it's very interesting. Yes, um, um, yes um, we've heard from, um, you know, uh, the three speakers and the world of the word that is um, coming up is empowerment, is um, education, is you know making things um, understandable to both young people and those who are in marriage. But I have here, um, Sheikh, um, something that came up, a question uh, about the, the Muslims. Muslims can marry up to four wives. Am I correct, Sheikh? Yes, they can. They are allowed to marry up to four. OK. The wives may not necessarily be living with their husbands or with their husband in the same household or even the same country. There may be some temptations for sex outside the marriage. How does the Muslim teaching advise them about sexual health? Uh, I think it's a very interesting question and uh, it's a question as I mentioned from the beginning, it's going to be with us and um, I, I think because we are talking about the natural urge to, fu to fulfill a natural satisfaction, sometimes whether in um, uh, a pre-planned way or a non-pre-planned way, there's not gonna be a single silver bullet. But I think institutions and organizations tend to draw guidance from the values, the way they, their values that inform their way, the way they approach to life, um, you know, uh, defined, and this is where I listened very, you know, carefully to the previous two speakers. And I don't think there is any kind of conflict, but in between is the question of the intrinsic approach, you know, the value that each one of them see. I mean, inform how we see this kind of uh, you know relationship, sex, from the Islamic perspective. 
we believe and we are told that sex is a very, very important element for human survival. And uh, the survival of the human race is one of the, the, the primary and the cardinal principles of the, of the divine guidance in Islam, meaning you know, life has got to be protected. And, uh, you know, the, and the, the, through the process of procreation, then there is a natural recycling of life. I mean, use, that is my own chosen word, recycling, meaning the continuity of life. But, and secondly, and this will be maybe a surprise to, you know, to some of the viewers, sex um, consummation, legitimate social, sexual consummation is considered as an act of obedience to God, because in it, there is a fulfillment of each or either party's needs within the legal and the legitimate relationship that is based on trust and love and mutual commitment to navigate the hurdles of life. So the, for Islam, the question of protecting that is really essential at the heart of the guidance because it informs, it, it is part of the fabrics that make a stable and peaceful and uh, safe society. So there's no question about that. But what happens is that uh, when it comes to the youngsters, um, of course, you know, the desire just comes natural and then those impulses tend to force people. And it's not just a question of the young people. You often see how people go overboard. And that's why we hear incidents of rape, incidents of, you know, you know, uh, you know in ancestry in the families, because, you know, the, the desire goes overboard. And uh, this is where in Islam, um, it has to be, it is managed. And that's why, you know, Baton mentioned that Islam allows up for women. Yes, it allows, but it doesn't instruct. It doesn't instruct. And it doesn't force, and it encourages a dialogue where the two parties seem to be okay with it, uh, especially if the other party can inform the other why they need it, rather than having what you would call, I don't know, the, you know they, they use the word side chick, you rather do it in a manner that is actually makes that part be part of the marriage. But regarding sex, you know, uh, you know, safe sex is also very, very important because in Islam, you know, our prophet, the teachings require that, you know, before you get married to someone, make sure you look very, very carefully because there might be something that you may, you may not be able to see. And if anyone in Islam, if one of the potential, you know, couple knew that I had something that might not be, might turn to be harmful to my, what is going to be my other half, it is a duty upon to declare it. That's why the issue of you know, pre-marital you know, medical checkups are very, 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 very essential. So coming back to the issue of sex, even after marriage, it has to be you know, protected. So Islam from the word God discourages any sex outside marriage, but it doesn't mean that he who happens to be overcome by the urge and the desire is left out, of course not. Uh, if there is a need that um, you know such engagement has happened, then of course this were the automatic inbuilt mechanism of encouraging, the advising to check on them. So it's really very very important. It's not a question whether someone has engaged in two illicit you know sexual relationship that is no longer Muslim. No, Islam you know as a religious person you are never perfect. You can be good today and bad tomorrow, and those mechanisms that are intended to secure a safe and the stable society are going to be in place, whether that person is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. So to both Muslims, we will encourage them to go and see the doctor where they have you know, been pushed beyond the margins of protecting themselves before the legitimate relationship. But even those who are within the marriage, for some reason, they're always the guy to check on themselves. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, the reason for this question is um, um, in my my career and everybody talks about it is when you approach, for example, um, a man or a lady who is Muslim and living in a polygamous uh, uh, marriage, and you ask them about their sexual health or to have you ever had a test for any sexually transmitted condition or any or, or HIV. They say, no, there's no need for me to test because I'm a married person. And that is always the answer. Mm. So is there any initiative within the uh, Muslim community, uh, either in the mosque or in some of these uh, educational uh, places 
to educate young people, even before marriage, about sexual health and how to be empowered about their sexual um, you know, health. Yeah, of course there is. And uh, you know, just to go a little back a little bit back about the, you know, the uh, you know, one checking themselves. I think um, it's not just a question of you know these STDs, sexual related diseases, but anything to do with uh, you know, you know, with one's life. People's approach tends to be very different. There are people who are always very happy and you know, they don't find any problem in them. So imagine we have another problem, for example, of diabetes and uh, you know, sickle cells within the BEM community. People are always reluctant to go, for example, check them so they don't want to hear the unexpected. So they'd rather stay as they are, even if the potential is there, the potential of the illness and the challenge of human being in the community. But as far as you know, your question is concerned, many, many Muslims and many Muslim organizations and the most in particular do run these regular clinics. And I know, for example, Regent Spark Mosque, East London Mosque, and so many mosques, they do run regular you know, uh, you know, clinics, even during the course of this COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown. There have been so many uh, you know, virtual meetings to discuss these things. There have been so many for us where this issue have been brought to the attention, especially of the youngsters. So it's not something that is being neglected, but yes, there is an attempt, but you're talking about a very small section. Uh, it's one thing sometimes to advise the youngsters, but for them to take the initiative, I do find from the one that I do talk is very, very difficult. But they still have that fear of the unknown. They don't want to be told, especially as we see nowadays, it's not about the STDs. We see the issues of cancer, which never used to be associated very much with the young generation. It's a very, very rampant. So that fear of the unknown, tends to be now, again, a scare for them to do what is the need for them, uh, even where organizations like mosques and churches and um, other institutions um, and even local statutory organizations, they have the facilities, the services there, but I do trust, you know, very few people do come for this, even if the danger is ending and still rapid. Thank you, Sheikh Suleiman. Um, is there anybody who wants to to compliment or ask question to, you know, to add on what Tech has just said. I would, like, I would like to say something. So yeah. we have two issues here. The first issue is educating people to go and have regular checkups. Mm -hmm. And the other issue that I'm hearing is when they're in a committed relationship, how do we educate them to continue to get checkups? But I have to be honest with you. If I'm in a committed relationship, I'm not going to use a condom. We have to be realistic. <laughs> we, we, like, we, we have to be realistic. And I, and I feel like saying that two married people or two people in a committed relationship after they've had a checkup. So let's just say me and my partner were new. We go to the clinic together. We both get tested. It's great. Well, you know, we've come back all clear. We've been responsible. Are we really now going to go and use a condom? No, we're not. And I, and I can't sit here and, um, and advocate that because that's not something that I would do. What I would do with my partner is make sure that there is a level of respect and a level of love. And I would hope that if he felt the need to seek another woman, that A, he would either tell me beforehand, or B, if he is going to do that, to use protection. And he needs to be an educated individual to know that he's having unprotected sex with me. And if he goes and has unprotected sex with another woman who he doesn't know if she's had a checkup or not, then he comes back to me that I'm at risk and that could affect my fertility, that could affect my health. That is the conversation that we need to have. And again, it boils down to respect. But we, we, we have to be, uh, we have to be reasonable with these requests. And I'm a young person <laughs> and I speak to other young people and I just can't see someone being in a committed relationship and still using a condom. Even if you don't want to get pregnant, they usually use birth control. Yeah. You wouldn't usually use a condom because it's 
you, you know, it's, it's not something that's natural. You want to feel your, um, your partner. You want to feel close to your par partner. It's a special moment for you both, yeah. right? And that is one of the main reasons why people get into a relationship, so, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So what would, so, you, uh, what would your advice be then for, for that? Like, how would you advise a couple in a committed relationship to still use a condom? Yeah. Um, I think you are right there. The reality is actually that uh, most people who are in a uh, single, or let me say single stable relationship, are uh, unlikely to use prevention methods like using a condom. However, um, if they respect each other, they can talk about any um, sexual health issues. Uh, mind you, uh, some of these issues may not be because of um, uh, transmission of uh, STI, it might be something like, I'm having a discharge. What is it for? Is it chlamydia? Is it thrush? Is it something else? So as long as they can communicate, well, exactly. that mm -hmm. is uh, really very, very important. I've got another question here. And this is, this is, yeah, hello? Is there a chance we can get, I'm trying to log in on another device because I'm running out of battery on this one, please. You can let me in on the other device. If you see someone. Okay. Yes, um, yes. Um, I'll, I'll inform Ian. Ian is in the background. He'll let you in. Okay. okay. So, Madam Storm. Yes, sir. Sexual empowerment is a crucial aspect of women's health. Absolutely. And I, I don't think only... I don't think it is only women's health, but you know, total sexual health. When women have control over their sexual life, it can reduce the risk of acquiring HIV and other STIs. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in most African communities, as a result of cultural and religious beliefs, talking about sex is a taboo. Mm -hmm. um, women often, often feel judged and ashamed mm -hmm. when they start to talk about sex. Mm -hmm. Do you have any initiatives to empower women or in, in women in relationships on managing their sexual health? Or yeah, health? That, no? it's much more bigger than that because as you, you know, you're, you must be aware that once we start looking at culture and religious beliefs, that has a big part to play in someone's um, values and self-beliefs, right? So yeah. I feel that we have to educate the men not just the women, we have to educate the men to respect the woman's voice, okay? <laughs> to understand that women are powerful individuals, okay? And that they should be respected and they have the right to say yes and they have the right to say no. The women need to feel empowered. They need to know that they're in control of their bodies and their minds and their sexuality. And that sex is about pleasure. It's about tapping into erotic power. It's about empowerment. And women need to feel sexually empowered when they're having sex. There's nothing worse than feeling disempowered because you've lost your voice during sex meaning you can't communicate your desires to your partner. You can't tell your partner whether you're enjoying something or not. That's really disempowering. Yep. That leaves yep. her feeling very helpless and not in control of her body. So for an individual to feel empowered, she has to find her voice. She needs a safe space where she can speak to other like-minded individuals about her desires and how she feels as a woman. And again, I feel like we need to remove any sort of stigma and shame um, towards a woman wanting to feel pleasured and how she wants to feel pleasured. Don't you think, like if I can come in. Yes. That, you may. Yes. We have at least I think to re-evaluate re our value systems. For example, mm. I visited Sweden some time back and the way the country runs its sexual education from an early age and mm. also the way parents mm. play a part in mm. raising their sons and daughters 
as mm -hmm. people, children, that has to be actually copied by many parents in this country, whether they're African parents or even from the broader society, because we fear as parents mm -hmm. to talk about sex with our children. Mm -hmm. And the education system is fighting. One side is saying children should not be taught sexual education. All these things have to start from an early age where children are empowered equally. If I'm raising my son as mm -hmm. a man, or mm -hmm. what he's supposed to be called a man, and it doesn't teach him how to respect girls, then mm -hmm. that child will grow up to be mm. a disservice to society by Absolutely. being, you know, these are things we have as parents mm -hmm. and as education system to mm -hmm. play a role. As parents, we Absolutely. have Absolutely. to look at our cultural upbringing and reevaluate certain things that we Absolutely. don't need. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the, see, what, see what the issue is here. I totally agree with absolutely everything that you just said about bringing up your children and teaching them. But within our culture, if we're talking about, you know, black people, um, Caribbean people, African people, they're going off of how their mothers and fathers work towards sex. So sometimes they're not even equipped with it because they were taught to not talk about sex that that is something that's not spoken about in the household. But I do feel like education should start at home. I was brought up by two really liberal individuals who spoke very openly about sex with me, with all my siblings, which is why I have the attitude that I have towards sex as well. But I totally agree with what you're saying. And it just all boils down to education and I'm really respectful to different people's cultures and different religion backgrounds. I respect everybody's beliefs, but we have to educate not only ourselves, but other people on how to communicate effectively with one another and speak to your children, speak to your children about consent. What is consent? I've coached so many young women that are adults now who are afraid to say no. These are women that are like in their late forties who are still not comfortable with saying no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who are still uncomfortable with telling their partners what they want. I also work with 18 year old young women. They also don't know that they can say no. That it's, it's, it's okay to feel the way that they're feeling about their bodies and their home and their hormones. And we talk about sex education, but we need to, we need to educate our young people, not just only about consent, not just only teach them that sex is also about pleasure, but understanding their bodies. When I was growing up, my sex education didn't really tell me much, except for how to have babies. <laughs> Yeah, you are right. Um, really, early education and uh, sex education is 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 good. Um, definitely, we have both to educate the young ones and also the, the older ones, the parents, because as you said, parents grew up in another gener it's another generation where mm -hmm. information about sexual health wasn't uh, you know uh, sort of very important, and they yeah. are not very well educated about ways of passing on that information to their children. So really it's a matter of uh, checking the, look what the generation gap. And this leads me actually to the next question, which is directed to- Before uh, we go there, Charles, oh, can, yes. I a, can I make a comment about that? Yes, please. About sex education yes. relationships. In school, various uh, education systems present it differently. Uh, okay. Whereby sometimes the too little, too, too late, okay. or too much, too early. So where do we get the balance about educating the, these young people about sex education? So there should be a, a discussion about this. What does the, uh, the syllabus present for the children who are 
10 years old. What about those who are going into adolescence? How about those who are post 16? So those are, there should be a way of educating these people gradually. Because there's a program now whereby young, two young, young children are exposed to sex too much of it too early. Mm. And then there's an explosion. And then there's the, we had the earlier way of doing it whereby there was too little and too late. So where is the balance? That's where we have to open up the discussion so that people can have better understanding of this. Thank you, thank you, Father Valdia. Um, Dr. Chaze? Yes, sir. Um, you, you've almost touched on it. Um, do you think there is a real knowledge gap between the older and younger generations when it comes to sexual health? Uh, definitely, definitely. There is a lot of a big gap. Like for me, I've worked with young people and I've worked with adults. Yes. And uh, when you see what the young people know, it is they get it from social media, from their okay. friends. It is information that most of the time is wrong information. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And also, when you talk about parents, that why don't you talk to your child about, you know, going into menstruation? Oh my God, my daughter is still very young, and, and she's twelve and thirteen. So. There is a need to educate the adults, including parents and non-parents, but so long as they're in the age where they are adults, to understand that sex can be discussed. As I told you, when I went to Sweden, I visited a family. And when I, we came in with a friend, they said, where is dad? Oh, they're upstairs having sex. And I was very shocked. But when I discussed it with my friend when we went back, he said it is something which this society is teaching children that there is good and bad and the timing of having sex. So children grow up that parents, whether they have sex or not, it's their problem. But we know that at school they tell us don't have sex before 18. And the children, Sweden has the lowest teenage pregnancies in the whole world because they start teaching children at an early age and they participate as parents to learn how do you communicate with your children. And here, from what my experience is, mm -hmm. I've been working with children who are 17 and they are very, very, very ignorant about sex, about HIV, about STIs, but they have information which is very wrong. How do we start communicating and coordinating organizations like um, Positive East to work with the schools around the area to have a common goal of educating young people and their parents, you know? And I used to have um, a leadership training, uh, residential training for a week with children. That worked very well because children would ask questions and the parents could communicate back. You taught my child this, why did you do that? And I explained to them, these are programs which we have to initiate as a community as leaders, whether it's, um, spiritual leaders or whether community leaders to work together and be able, and the men and women to be able to communicate, empowering women. Men, you talk about empowering women, they have no clue of what it is. So these are things we need to work together and be able to bring them out into the open. Thank you. Uh, any, any additional right. comment or question to Charles? Yes. I need Announce to make a comment on. about uh, the situation in Uganda at the moment. Right. During COVID, since schools have been closed, we have a serious case now of primary school children who have become pregnant. And they're going for exams now with children. 
So <laughs> here we are, we have an issue when the virus, the pandemic has led to another explosion. How do we face the situation? So we are in a dilemma now. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> that's, yes. a, that's a really um, double jeopardy as they use Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Um, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> now, still with Father Valinia, let me ask a question about men. Uh, men are less likely to present uh, for HIV testing or uh, sexual health screening. Is, it, is this cultural or are they trying to prove that they are brave? Is it lack of awareness? No, how do they, how should they prioritize their sexual health needs? Um, you know, women are very good, you know, in presenting and coming up to take a to take tests, to check their um, sexual health. You know, they, they, they take up all the smears on time and everything. Men, they don't even care about their prostates and things like that. So uh, what do you think? Yeah, it's, I think it is uh, something, a macho thing. <laughs> I'm a man, I'm in control, I have power. I think that's the starting point of it. And then until education goes into the real basics of this issue, we are in a problem. So the men feel that they are strong, they are powerful, they are in charge. I want sex now, okay? Yes. Don't tell them anything else, okay? So what's on their mind? Sex, <laughs> right? When? Now, <laughs> right? Are you ready? No, don't matter about, about that. I want it now. So it is a macho thing. It's the power thing, which people have, the men have. <laughs> and right. have yes. So that's one of, one of the programs. And so that's where we need to educate the people, the children, especially at a young age, and then teach them to respect the equal dignity of men and women, to okay. have a concern for health of themselves and be responsible in dealing with one's urges and desires through self-control and self-discipline. Thank you so much. Well, um, I think this is the last question um, for all of you just to discuss. Yes, How comfortable you... are you to discuss sexual health with members of your community? Sheikh, are you there? Yeah, yes, I'm here. Um, I just want to make, I just want to make a simple um, small comment on the, you know, what the, the previous speaker, you know, sorry, I can't remember the name. Father, Father Gerard, yes. Father Gerard, thanks very much for that wonderful contribution. Um, but the, I, I think we are talking about the, the Black, uh, the BAME community, and it's not only the BAME community, but there's something about culture that I was mentioning at the beginning of this. Uh, what we don't know is that, um, is how long it takes for, um, for the cultures to evolve and maybe adopt new realities. But beyond the African community, we do have, for example, the Asian community, the Arab community, and so many other communities. And many of these communities talking about these things are quite a taboo, not in a bad way, but because that's not how they are used to talk about things. Now, we might not say this is their own you know, problem because that's when everyone has got a culture and uh, it, you know, it takes time you know, to, for people to evolve, especially generations of them. But we can't wait you know, to solve the problem until people do come to, to accept their, their, the different you know, realities. But it also answers the same question here that um, why men? It's the same thing. Um, I know of some cultures where you live in some parts of the world where if you spoke to someone, say, hello, how are you? How is your sister? You will feel offended. How dare you speak to me about my sister? Not because of your color, but because of their culture, you are not allowed you know, to discuss about members of family, especially of you know, you know, female you know, gender. But so that, that is them. But what I've noticed here that is a little bit missing here is that I think there is a missing gap in terms of the education if we want the message to pass on, to be passed on to ensure that if anything, if at all, there is going to be some kind of relation to building up between you know, um, you know, the, the boys and the girls or men and women, I think 
quite often the young generation, especially the girls and boys born in this country, tend to be more reciprocal, you know, to the advice that has been given to them, and they're very responsive. But the first generation who are also equally, you know, at the heart of raising these children, and they're still informing their culture as they grow, they seem to be left out. So when a child, when they hear through the media, you know, that you, you can go and speak to your doctor, to your GP, you don't need to consult your parents, they feel that, well, you know, what's going on? And this, in reality, from the so many community, you know, members of the community you speak to, is a big issue. For them, it appears like you are robbing away their child and you are taking over, bringing in something that is, appears to be, you know, it's a promotion of what, is, what doesn't conform to the culture. So if we can bring the culture, I mean, the communities together, start with the educating the family, I think it will go a very, very long way. I have seen many, many people who, after um, being victims of certain kind of medical condition, they have come up very, very strongly and they want to champion the campaign to educate the community about this. And they see that even me before I reach this point, for example, we talk about the, um, uh, um, what cancer uh, that's very common. Prostate? Prostate. Yeah, prostate oh. cancer. You know, many members of the BEM, they're not quite happy to talk about all these things, but I've seen many people who almost lost their life and they have come out to be very, very strong. They want to champion this. And what they tell you is that I would never ever, I could never imagine I'll come and talk about these things, let alone go for some kind of screening or test because, you know, no, you know, how dare you leave someone look at you? That is, it's impossible. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in addition to train, uh, educating the youngsters, we cannot leave those constituents which are part and parcel of the child's development. That is the parents. We need to bring them on board so that the training, you know, is well connected and the advice well connected. Where, you know, safe, safe cannot be delayed until there is legitimate relationship. Then those who have chosen to go outside, uh, you know, they, you know, they make the cultural norms. They at least give the best advice about how to protect themselves. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, yes, uh, we are almost, we have come to the end of our discussion. However, um, uh, we at Positive East, we provide free HIV awareness training and uh, training has been an issue uh, from the discussions. We'll have to reinforce that, make sure we target the young co population and uh, also people from uh, other communities. Uh, we provide free HIV remote testing and sexual health um, screening. Um, just go to our website and you'll find a very young man to, you know, Mr. Pat. I don't know whether it's a Mr. or Miss, but you'll find Pat and some questions and he'll chat to someone. Um, we have got, um, you know, outreach to communities that have enhanced needs, that like refugees and homeless people. So uh, we have services and if you one can visit our website, everything is laid in there. I would like to thank you as well um, for, for all your contributions. The panelists, you've done a very, very wonderful work. And I know this subject is a hot subject and we can stay here for hours discussing about it. But uh, what we'll do is summarize. And when I report to, to my managers, to other people, I'll make sure that I'll emphasize all these points that have been raised. I also thank our viewers that have been viewing, you know, watching us on Facebook Live. And also I thank the Positive East staff that has supported us to have this event, uh, the, uh, the communications team especially and the prevention and testing team. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we've run out of time. I would have loved to discuss more about this subject and I really enjoyed, and actually it was getting warming up. Um, <laughs> thank you, Madam Storm. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheikh Aslimash. Thank, thank you, thank Father Gerard Banya. Thank you, Dr. Chaze. This is a great, great discussion, and we will continue. This is not the end. We'll continue to discuss these issues uh, on different platforms. Make sure that we, we get things right. Make sure that we protect our people, our communities, 
Uh, there are so many sexually transmitted infections out there. Um, there are so many of our people who are living with HIV, who have HIV and they don't know that they have it. And these are the people we want to, to get out, yes. Um, um, early education on media, there is a, a comment, early education on media literacy is also very important because in where we are going, I think we are going digital. So we, we, ha we have to educate communities digitally. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll get in touch again. I've got all your emails and contacts, but uh, again, if somebody asks, I may refer them to you for education. And uh, if you get somebody from your communities, just give them our website. We've got a range of services and we, we've got a training uh, uh, person who, who commands training, is ready to train communities and, uh, you know, big groups in any settings. Thank you so much.